Let me ask you maybe the most basic question. We're told we need this new Chips and Science Act to get really semiconductor manufacturing back onto the shore in the United States. If it's a good idea to make the semiconductors here, why do we need the government to help us? Why didn't the markets take care of this problem on their own? That's a great question. Um, in general, I think the semiconductor industry has had a history of being um, very productive and um, not needing assistance. However, in the case of manufacturing over the course of the last decade, it's really drifted um, outside, not just the, the core wafer fabrication, but also the rest of the supply chain is really drifted into um, other areas of the world geographically where there's been um, lower cost of, of building, operations, et cetera. We're told that it's because of competitiveness, the need to compete, but also national security concerns. From what you understand, is it more of one than the other, or is it even? Well, I, I mean, I do think that it's a combination. Um, I don't know if it's even, but uh, the national security concern is a geopolitical concern. Um, certainly, from a supply chain availability perspective, we learned through COVID that geographic distribution of supply um, can be helpful. And um, we need that. We need more diversity of supply chains. So it's beyond, um, you know, any one concern. I think we had a we had a perfect storm during COVID of shortages and other things. And we, out of that, you know, the conversations, the Chips Act was born. I am excited about the opportunity to start really doing some work to move towards a more balanced ecosystem. What's the goal? You just said balanced ecosystem. Is the goal self-sufficiency in the United States, that we can produce everything we need? Is that even possible to do? What should our goal be? Um, you know, our goal should be that we have more availability of the complete semiconductor supply chain, not just wafer for fabrication, but also packaging and memories and other things, all within not just the United States. You know, I'm not one for uh, protectionism per se, but but in a broader distribution and and better access, candidly for you know companies. So, um, can the United States produce everything? Intel has done it for decades. Um, there are other companies that are required in the ecosystem around um, wafer fabrication to actually build the whole thing. Uh, my firm, Ampere Computing, makes. Uh, high performance semiconductors that are power efficient for servers that run your cloud and your internet. But this is what they look like. So just to give you an idea of what a semiconductor for your viewers looks like, a, a, a chip like this, which has 128 cores, has about 55 billion transistors on it, things that you can't imagine how complex it is to build one of these. The supply chain around this is equally complex. So the wafer fabrication, the thing that we're, we talk a lot about and uh, the thing that we uh, know Intel for and TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor and others, this was made at Taiwan Semiconductor, but it was actually packaged by a US company called Amcor, but it was packaged in Asia. And so we need to see more of that entire supply chain move to the U.S. And a large portion of the first phase of the CHIPS Act is to um, do what we would call incentive, you know, investment into the United States. Renee, where are we from your perspective, sort of in the longer scope of history with respect to semiconductors? And let me ask about supply and demand. Supply and demand in a different sort of sense. Supply, we all sort of know, have heard about Moore's Law, right? It's going to you have increasing density. Where are we in that path? Does it trail off at some point. On the other hand, on the demand side, how much computing power do we need? And how do those two match up? Um, well, demand, I'm going to take that one first because it's um, very straightforward. It's unabated, really. And um, we're entering into a phase. It's interesting. I've worked in this industry for, for about 30 years. And every time we think we're at the end, you know, whatever the phase was, whether it was the PC cycle or, the, or um, you know, smartphones, we think this is it. What are people going to need more computing for? And it turns out there's always, you know, another frontier of discovery. We can call it AI. We can, um, you know, there's lots of other things in the field of AI um, that just require more compute. In addition to that, we're trying to do more with compute. Our cars are getting smarter. Our homes are getting smarter. You know, every aspect of our life even in non-scientific, just daily life. So demand of all sorts of semis. So it's not just high performance like what I build, but it's also 
um, what we in the industry call lagging edge, that the, the use older technologies, and we saw a lot of shortages of that in automotive, that, that companies like Global Foundries, a US company built. So um, demand growing multi-segment demand growing, that's good news. Not every segment, some segments are flat, some segments will go into decline, but the overall semiconductor industry growing. So uh, coming back to the Chips and uh, Science Act here, how transformative will it be? $50 billion sounds like a lot of money to many of us, as I understand it, given how expensive these plants are, maybe not so much, maybe it will leverage up more private investment, but will it really change the semiconductor industry and indeed the tech industry in the United States? Well, you know what it will do is it will, um, it's already done this. It's brought the importance of semiconductors and the semiconductor industry, an industry that was pioneered, founded in the United States. Um, the R&D continues to be led in the United States. Uh, it has brought it into the public discourse. I think that's important. It's a bipartisan issue. We all are very concerned about the long-term competitiveness of an important fundamental industry that supports many, many other um, industries, you know, I think that what the Chips and Sciences Act does is it raises the awareness, it creates the opportunity for companies that may not come to the United States, like Taiwan Semiconductor or Samsung or others who have made commitments. In the United States, it's more expensive, I mean, candidly, for them to build and to operate. So it gives us a level playing field in some areas. It's the beginning, it's not the end. I think private uh, money, will need to assist $50 billion of which the first tranche is very focused on manufacturing not uh, and, and latter tranche um, on R&D is, is a small, small amount of money in semiconductor world, but it is an important signal that we're open for business and that we are um, moving forward and are sincere about getting better geographical distribution of supply. And finally, Renee, uh, a lot of people call this industrial policy, which I guess is what it basically is. Not everybody thinks that's a good idea. The United States has had a mixed track record, I think it's fair to say, in that area. What do you, from the semiconductor industry, how do you regard this as industrial policy? And what is the difference between good industrial policy and maybe not so good? I'm not sure I'm qualified to give a uh, give an overview of industrial policy. I'll give you my point of view, which is, um, Yes, in some ways it can be con considered industrial policy. I consider this um, positive industrial policy because it's in it's incenting investment and it's incenting um, you know private investment alongside and what we would think of as reverse foreign direct investment into the United States. It is um, you know I I don't think uh, industrial policy that's economic protectionism is particularly productive. This is not part of it. Um, I think it's important. This is a global business. It's a global industry. Um, we know that if we try to do something that's protectionist because we're not competitive or something like that, it tends to not uh, end up being as productive as we'd want it to be. That's not what the Chips and Sciences Act is, in my opinion. In my opinion, this is a positive movement towards encouraging people to invest in a segment that's critical to the future, not only in national security, but of you know, scientific breakthroughs um, in what we do. 